news came from Beijing about Tiananmen Square. I was studying at Nanjing University, so it was about a thousand miles away from Beijing. The only place that things can happen is Beijing, and I have to be there, and I have to be part of it. In 1989, a lot of people have gone through the same sort of thought, uh, have gone through the same kind of determination to make up their mind to go to Tiananmen Square, to stay there until the very end. The world probably will never forget the image of a young man standing along in front of a column of tents. I think what the, the world also should remember is that there was an entire generation standing behind that young man. This generation, my generation, came from Cultural Revolution. They were born there and they raised at that time, which is the darkest time in modern history. Mao presented the Cultural Revolution as a Marxist dream, but in reality, it was a nightmare. It was part of his own struggle to hold on to power. What happened in Cultural Revolution is kind of glorification of hatred, uh, legitimizing murder, killings, punishment, persecu uh, persecution. The Cultural Revolution started in 1966 and lasted for 10 years. But the worst part of it was during the Right Guard movement when millions of young people set out to destroy everyone they believed to be enemies of Mao. Crazy with the power Mao had given them, they created a nationwide anarchy of terror. Chinese social structure collapsed, and hundreds of millions of people suffered. I was born just a month before the Cultural Revolution. My father was a Soviet educated engineer, and, um, and my mother was a uh, daughter of a rich landlord. And so all of those backgrounds make them very susceptible to a class struggle in Cultural Revolution. And indeed, as soon as the Cultural Revolution started, both of them were separated and sent into labor camps, re-education through labor, so they can't raise me anymore. So I was given first to a peasant's family, and then they don't like me, and send me to another family. Once again, they didn't like me. So I was another one, another one. It seems nobody liked me. So I end up in this kitten garden at the age of three. It's more like a kind of orphanage. And even in the kitten garden, it's kind of a reflection of the society. It's a macro reflection of society. You know, you have first official, you have final among the second or third, and once you get into the official position, you can bully other people. At that time, during the height of a cultural revolution, a, a bad family background would be enough to put you into a category of the lowest of society. Everybody can spit on you. Everybody can order you around, and uh, you're just nobody. But there's a one event which, uh, which not only changed my life in Kitten Garden, but also, I think, changed my life forever. I don't know how to describe it, but it has to do with a lizard. The teacher ordered me to stand by the door where it's really cold with my bare foot. Everybody laughed at me. And all of a sudden, I realized actually something's going on on my feet. So I think I was stunned. I can't move. Because according to the tale that we knew in the kitten garden, once the lizard touch you, you either have to die, or the part the lizard touches will fall off instantly. So I, I think for the whole night, I was dreaming all kinds of things happening to me.
I dare not to see what happened to my feet. But I have to get up. So gradually I turn the quilt. And here they are, a pair of feet, not much different uh, from the one yesterday I have. That really made me feel kind of special now. I have nothing to offer. I have no cookies, no picture books, nothing. No nothing about outside world. But now I'm a friend of a lizard, this most poisonous, fearsome, powerful monster. In this friendship, I found my strength. I know somehow that there is some mysterious force supporting me. And with the confidence this force gave me, I gained the respect of others. Whenever I made a very important decision in my life, <laughs> whenever I was uh, hesitated, whenever I kind of a little bit scared, uh, don't know what to do, and yet have to go on, I thought about lizards. <laughs> I thought of the lizard again in 1989, on the train from Nanjing to Beijing, on my way to Tiananmen Square. I don't have money to buy a ticket, so I sneaked into the train. And I had nothing but a pair of underwear in my pocket. That's all I had when I went to Beijing. And yet I have the same determination are we going to make some differences? We were raised to be educated, to be told constantly that what we had is paradise on earth. The system created by Mao and continued by Deng is a system which fundamentally denied individual freedom and the basic respect of human rights. It is a system which controlled every aspect of your life. It is all powerful and is everywhere. I remember there's one time after I was kicked off from kindergarten and I was sent to my latest adopted family. This is the first time I've ever encountered love sex crimes. And in communist China, during Cultural Revolution, all three concepts are somehow twisted together. It took place in an abandoned castle where my friends and I played. But one day, something happened. And when we walked into the building, we discovered there's a lot of white papers with blood. Blood in Chinese terms always uh, means something unlucky. So we left the building. And one day we went to the castle again, but this time the castle's entrance was blocked by the bricks. And on the wall, there was a big poster issued from the local people's court. It was said that a young man and a woman were having sex in that building and was caught by our good people's army and they were sentenced to the labor camp. There's a crowd of people approaching us. At the head of the team was that young couple. The woman have a pair of worn shoes in front of her breast. And the man was shouting loudly, I am a rapist. I am a rapist. I was thinking for a long time why the authorities is always seeking the opportunities to punish those who fall into love with each other. Stand because by denying one of the most fundamental desires of a human being, they deny humanity as a whole. And only by denying humanity, they can make people and turn people into political tools. 
I know there is a great danger for me going to Beijing, so I told my girlfriend that I was going to visit home. I don't want her to worry. Yet it doesn't really scare me at all. I have survived many disasters. I could never really forget the earthquake when I was ten in my hometown Tangshan. More than 240,000 people were killed, more than half of the town. And what is important to me is that I lost every member of my latest adopted family. Whenever I remember that event, it's just full of nightmare. Everybody is dead by the time I get there, except little six. Little Six and I probably the closest in that family, and I always know that I'm going to find some way to deal with any situation, and depend on me. And even right before he died, he said, "I can't breathe anymore. Try harder. I know you can save me." And I couldn't. Didn't receive any relief support for a long time. I began to understand a term in Chinese politics. It's called grasp people, dirt people, which means the people of nobody. The government didn't really care about the people in Changshan, and at that time I realized I'm only part of this people of nobody, people without any voice and without any power. I had always wished that I could have grown up faster, 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 so that I will be strong enough to do something to help them. After the earthquake, I was collecting the ruins, and、uh, all of a sudden, I find a lot of Western postcards. It is so beautiful, and the men's women have kind of smiles you never see in Cultural Revolution China. And I remember that night, I had a dream that I, I was carried by an angel, and to a, to a new place where people smile、uh, with pigeons, with beautiful buildings. So ever since then, I know that there's the entire outside world exists, and they live completely different. Only one month after the earthquake, Mao died. And we began to gradually mark a departure from cultural evolution. Few years later, this is the Deng Xiaoping era. We began to get different ideas other than Mao's quotation. Deng encouraged the people to hang posters on a wall in central Beijing, expressing their anger over the excesses of the cultural evolution. This was called the Democracy Wall. But the criticism went beyond what Deng had hoped, so he quickly shut it down and arrested those who pushed the criticism too far. The worst offender was Wei Jinsheng, one of my heroes, one of the most vigorous critic of the system, and the most idealistic, enthusiastic announcers of a future different system. 也都是逐渐转到了认识到，就是说，中国的问题呢，必须要从搞民主这个角度来来解决它，其他的角度可能是不太能够解解决了。但是在七九年的时候呢，这样想的人还不是很多。It's the first one who spelled out the importance of human rights and democracy, and for that he was put into Chinese dark jail fifteen years. 就是在一个小房间里，一天到晚就在这个房间里待着，而且是长年累月的。而且就是仅仅是这样还不够，他还想一些其他办法来来折磨你。他可以一年不让你晒太阳，不放风，住在一个背阴的房子里。这样时间长了，你肯定就要生病了，各方面的器官都都会出毛病。比如说牙齿，牙齿肿了，他不给你看
不给你治疗，什么药也不给你。Because of him, many people, including myself, were inspired. 七九年的民民主强运动呢，它真正开始起了作用了，在人民群众中开始传播开来了。用中国话讲，就是生了根，发了芽。In the early 80s, at one hand, we have to stick to the proletarian dictatorship, and at the same time, began new periods called open door policy. We began to have books translated from the West. You began to even have the uh, the TV serial from the West, and all of a sudden we realized that the people in the so-called capitalist world live much, much better than we do. And I try not to think about those earlier days and that kind of sense of loneliness. And try to integrate myself into a bigger picture. We could only learn about the true China through books and magazines bought on the black market. And my generation came to realize what life was, is, could be, and indeed should be. I was constantly reading、um, almost every piece published at that time.、Um, And I sort of related those experiences to my own experiences, and began to have a general picture about what had happened. Deng Xiaoping, maybe wear a different mask from Mao, but equally cruel and brutal in nature. There were tens of thousands of political prisoners, but there was still a dream of a more democratic China, especially in the hearts of the students. I began to know more about Communist Party. One of the few high government officials who championed real change was Hu Yaobang, General Secretary of the Communist Party. Because of his support of an earlier student movement, he was ousted from power in 1987. So when the news came from Beijing about the death of Hu Yaobang. It was a quite a chilling effect on me, and his death obviously also symbolized the end of the hope for the internal reform. Within hours of his death, memorial posters began appearing on campuses across China. By that afternoon, the first mourners appeared in Tiananmen Square. The movement had begun, and in 1989, in the way that I felt, I am ready. Finally, I'm grown up, and I should take that responsibility now. There's a voice telling me that I must go. And for me, this is something that I have yearned for my whole life. This is the time I must do something. I knew that many things had happened in Beijing without me. Tens of thousands of students had poured into the streets, and then on the day before my arrival in Beijing, the government published articles, officially denouncing the student leaders as liars. Whose goal was to create turmoil? I really don't know what the Beijing students are going to respond to. Be really hostile and scary. April 26 editorial. When the train was approaching Beijing, I was quite anxious. None of us want to volunteer ourselves and go to the street. None of us really imagine that what is going to happen. Even now, coming together almost five years later, 
we were still sorting through the events of the spring of 1989. Wang Chaohua represented intellectuals at that time. Wu Kai Shi, he's very charismatic, so therefore a lot of people responded to his cause. Chai Ling, compared with other student leaders, was more like a spiritual leader. Wang Dan, who is still in China, took the lead and organized the initial demonstration from Beijing University to Tiananmen Square. Facing each other is to face ourselves. To see us all together immediately bring us back to the confusion of those exciting, hopeful, and ultimately painful days. To me, um, I guess I'm the type of person who feel like I can't, um, if I don't do something for my country at this point, I'll be ashamed of myself the rest of my life. I hope if I have this opportunity, the students can come to the country to do the work. So I think I'm the kind of, how do I say, to get the students' love to the students. Only the curiosity brought me to Tiananmen Square to watch what what's going to happen. We certainly, all of us, have smelled some something's going to happen. We decided to uh, have April 27th as the Liberty Day for China. And I was in the very front of the demonstration. And we can see the feeling of joy in every face, which hasn't been there for 40 years. It's amazing for me. So I thought that's the first time I thought it in such a way as if we might got some real results from such a disciplined student movement. When I walk out at the gate of the Beijing train station, it was like late afternoon, and people were so excited and talking about the demonstration which just passed by a moment ago. That was the moment I was reassured that this time we were going to make a difference. But at the same time, I was also very scared because I know exactly what happened if you stand up in China and confront such an oppressive and all-powerful regime. Because I know what happened to my grandparents, to my parents, and to me earlier, so I don't have any illusions. This is the first time that the 200,000 students in Beijing got together. There were three times more people came out of their home to support the students by marching with them. Everybody realized that if we act in solidarity, we are powerful. We were all in our 20s, and probably a little bit older, but equally innocent in terms of politics. And all of a sudden, by historical incidents, accidents, we were put in a position in which we have to bear the responsibility of a fate of a country of a billion people. What's so genuine about this movement, it is more of an individual movement. Everybody has their own reason to be there. For so many years, every time we try to make a difference, all we faced was suppression and punishment and the lie and propaganda. So I think at that moment, we make a decision, enough is enough, now is our time to do something. I formed a strong friendship with student leaders like Chai Ling, Feng Zongde, and others. Because as soon as I arrived in Beijing, I began to go to every campus to talk to student bodies, to talk to student organizers. And by talking to them, I realized a lot of people had a similar thought. We needed to legitimize our movement with a democratically elected student leadership. Within a week, most of the major campuses held elections, and the central leadership was strengthened. 
I try to be a representative from our own campus. When Ward Casey was there and asked us for our general strategy. What students wanted is real basic things. One is officially withdraw the uh, April 26 editorial. Number two is open, direct, and the equal dialogue with the government. It seems to some of you maybe very simple and a very like uh, naive uh, condition the student stated. We knew that the government had never been in the habit of listening to the voice of the people. They will never do that. The two basic demands in this way of attempting to survive. We are not trying to overthrow the government. We were not trying to uh, have any violence. We want reform. We wanted to generate enough pressure to put the government in the very awkward position of having to accept open dialogue with the students. So we organized various lively ways of demonstration to present our cause to the widest possible audience. But the real breakthrough came on May 4th when journalists for the first time joined the demonstration. The press corps openly rebelled against the government and through their truthful reporting, the demand of a dialogue with the government spread all over China and got widespread sympathy from all sectors. From that moment on, we began to present ourselves as more of a formidable force against the government. The government promised a dialogue, but each time they canceled the promised meetings, most of us began to realize that the government never intended to have a serious dialogue with the student representatives. Usually, um, the government takes three steps to crack down a movement. First, editorial um, articles and to basically name the movement as anti-revolutionary movement. The second, just crack down. And third, just arrest people or persecute people. And so we know what will come next. But at the same time, the government refrained from cracking down on the movement. What held them back was Gorbachev's impending visit to Beijing. This was the first time in 30 years that China and the Soviet Union were going to hold a summit. A proposal of a hunger strike during Gorbachev's visit circulated among the students. Even to the most courageous, such a plan seemed too risky. Holding a hunger strike meant, in the eyes of the government, a declaration of independence by the students. It meant war. At the time, I was quite confused on making this decision, uh, either we should go to hunger strike or not, especially uh, after an argument with Chao Hua and some other students. There were also people who believed equally strongly that we could not let the government dictate our lives anymore. We want to fight for our own rights to be a Chinese citizen, and we want to fight for basic rights to be guaranteed from the Chinese constitution that we have right to freedom of speech, freedom of demonstration, freedom of um, assembly. You shouldn't, I'm sorry. Okay. I don't think that's my... Okay. okay, go ahead. Sure. Wang Chaohua and a number of others strongly believed that by starting such hunger strike, we would destroy the movement. I had a heavy quarrel with Chailin right on the day before the starting of hunger strike. I think that many real citizens, they don't really want another 10 years. Mao Zedong, another 10 years riot. With only two days before Gorbachev's scheduled arrival to Beijing, we decided to go ahead with the plans for hunger strike. The spokesperson of the hunger strike was Chai Ling. It was her speech on May 12 that finally moved enough people to join the demonstration. 
When I gave the speech, there was one student who said, it is my time to do something for my country. I want to join the hunger striker. Uh, China, I love you. And I think that was the feeling why the student joined the hunger striker. Once we made the decision to go ahead with the idea of the hunger strike, the professors of Beijing University were so moved that they decided to throw a banquet, a last meal. And the teachers gave speeches of encouragement to us. People began to sing international. Some students announced their last will. What went on in my mind was, what if nobody comes to support us on Tiananmen Square? The soldiers would come in, arrest all of us, and then we probably would just simply disappear. Our message would disappear. The movement would disappear. We marched for two hours on the road to Tiananmen Square. But unlike during most of the demonstrations, this time, a lot of people watched us in silence. Nobody knew what was going to happen in the hunger strike. It was very risky for everybody. One people told us on the way to the hunger strike, if you really want to please the people, to bring, your, bring yourself back from the Tiananmen Square safely and healthy would please us. Ni As soon as we entered Tiananmen Square, all of a sudden, it was like my worst nightmare had come true. It was empty. Nobody was there except us. My heart became very heavy, and I said, we must organize something immediately to get more people to come to support us. And by late afternoon, the first group of people began to come back carrying water, blankets, and more people came back with tents. And then gradually more and more people heard the news and came back to support us and were willing to stay with us for the entire night. It was so exciting. I realized at least for the first night we would be safe. Gorbachev's visit brought a tremendous amount of hope. He was regarded as a hero, a true reformer. As a matter of fact, we issued a public invitation for him to come to speak at Beijing University. At the same time, the government was very, very nervous. They were most interested, obviously, in saving face by getting the students out of the square using whatever means necessary. Every evidence suggested that the government was actively preparing for the crackdown. I weeped, cried publicly everywhere, trying to get students out of the square before Gorbachev's arrival. You don't have to tell people to get real reform for our life. The first count I got of the hunger strikers is a thousand and forty people. And more and more people each day, every minute, wanted to join the hunger strike. And then starting from the third day, May 15th, many, many people began to faint. And we began to hear sirens running almost non-stop 24 hours a day. Also, May 15th was when Gorbachev would arrive in China. He brought with him an international press corps of about 3,000 journalists. But all the journalists were completely captivated by the student movement. And Gorbachev even became second-rate news. For the first time, we saw so many foreign journalists meeting around looking for stories. You think the hunger strike will work? 
I'm not sure, but I think we, we should go to the extreme. And uh, yes, in China. For the first time, we also realized that the world was watching. Deng Xiaoping regarded Gorbachev's visit to Beijing as the highlight of his long-term political career. And now, Deng Xiaoping was very publicly humiliated. On May 16, Yan Mingfu, the Minister of Public Relations of Government and a famous reformer, came to see us. It was the first time a high-ranking communist official publicly supported the cause of the student movement. It was a highly emotionally charged conversation. He promised the government was going to deal with our request seriously as soon as Gorbachev left China. But at that time, the students especially became very suspicious about the government's motivation. At the same time, Communist Party General Secretary Zhao Ziyang, who was a strong reformer, told Gorbachev in a televised meeting that all decisions in China ultimately had to be made personally by Deng Xiaoping. That means that it was Deng Xiaoping who was preventing any dialogue from happening. A request that had by then gained wide support from across Chinese society. And so on May 17, the largest demonstration of the movement took place, maybe even the largest in Chinese history. As many as two to three million people went to the streets. People of all ages, people of all walks of life, people organized by their professions, by their working unit, all joined the demonstration. And there were simultaneous demonstrations in at least 150 cities across China. That was the turning point when the student movement became a people's movement became a true national democracy movement. Then, early in the morning of May 18th, I was told that the government wanted to hold a dialogue with the students. From a public relations point of view, the government had to show the people how irrational students were and how rational the government was. So they decided to hold a public meeting in which Li Peng deliberately antagonized the students' representatives and showed their emotional response on camera. What we ask is the real basic things on the meeting with Prime Minister Li Peng. And the government really shouldn't refuse this kind of simple conditions. The meeting ended in a contentious atmosphere. Prime Minister Li Peng threatened that the government would take appropriate action. Later that night, General Secretary Zhao Ziyang came to visit. He told the students in tears that he had come too late. Everything was too late. That suggested to us very strongly that there had been some fundamental change in policy. We began to see what was coming. so much. We showed the purity of our hearts by causing great bodily harm to ourselves to make a statement, to tell the government, to tell the people that we are not a riot and the student movement wanted to make China better. 
We continue to get information coming from various sources, all telling us the government will take appropriate action. The first thing came to my mind was we must immediately call off the seven-day-old hunger strike. And only one hour after we ended the hunger strike, Prime Minister Li Peng announced through the loudspeakers on Tiananmen Square that Beijing would be under the martial law as of 10 o'clock the next morning. Two hundred thousand troops were surrounding Beijing. There were airplanes flying all, all over Beijing city, and there were soldiers and tanks. Um, it was it was a very um, shocking feeling and anger, and uh, so I, I believe that was the first time. Um, make us really realize how brutal this, this regime is. People openly come out to the streets, millions of them, and went directly face to face with the militaries, with the tanks, organizing barricades to block every entrance to Beijing City. Ordinary Beijing citizens try to convince the soldiers not to open fire on the people, not to come into the city. Their passion was so genuine, and some of the soldiers were moved by their courage and decided to withdraw. <laughs> The most important decision for us to make at that time is how to react to martial law and whether the movement is over or just the beginning. I was in the headquarters the first day of a martial law. This is the time I saw my girlfriend. She came with a lovely, shining smile and told me, finally, I found you. Immediately, I felt so sad. I feel I have to urge her to leave, but she don't want. She said, it took me weeks for me to find you. How can I leave again? No, I'm going to stay right here with you, whatever happens. At that moment, I thought about life and love in abstract and how much things that life could offer at the age of 23 with such a beautiful young bride. <laughs> and I asked her, do you want to marry? She said, why not? <laughs> and immediately, <laughs> Chai Ling and all the others were cheered. They thought that's a great idea. Because a moment ago, everybody's so depressed and so sad. Everybody's prepared to die, maybe, by midnight tonight. I thought of a lot of things, but finally end up saying just two sentences. I said, uh, um, we came here not just for death, or not for death at all. We're here to look for a life that is worth of living. We need to struggle for that life, and we also need Mary. Let's continue the struggle. Let the beloved also get married. Follow my example, that's it. 
So that's, that, that cheered the crowd even more. So people began to sing songs. All of a sudden, it changed the deadly silence of the square. Chai Ling gave us a special tent. I had never been with a woman. We just began to undress ourselves when one of other friends of us break into my tent with a huge watermelon. He said, how dare you not to tell me this decision? And because of his, his uh, loud voices, it attracted a lot of more people. So we never got a chance to perform our duty. <laughs> And then immediately I send two of my best friends to escort her back to home. I told her I will go to look for her. Afterwards, if I'm still alive. So they went and uh, never see her again. Although everybody felt the imminent danger, nobody wanted to leave Tiananmen Square. People said that they felt so scared, alone, helpless, powerless at home. But as soon as they entered Tiananmen Square, they immediately felt hopeful. People tasted freedom, and they just wouldn't let it go that easily. So we felt a strong responsibility at the center of the movement. By May 23rd, we have this central command post established with coalitions of students, intellectuals, workers, citizens, with Charlene the commander and I was the deputy. It was probably the most terrifying period in the whole movement. And at the same time, also probably the most mature period. Our headquarters began to become a professional operation. And we spent about $100,000 a day for ordinary activities. We had to supply enough water. We had to build bathrooms. We had to feed on average 200,000 people a day, and this is no small task. And also at this point in time, we got tremendous support from outside China, particularly from Hong Kong. The students in Beijing sort of woke everybody up in Hong Kong and then reminded them as Chinese they, they should they should say and they should show their support for the students who have the love for, for the country. I organized together with some friends a concert for democracy in China to raise some money to support the students on the square. We raised about 12 million Hong Kong dollars, and I took some money uh, into Beijing to deliver to the students and uh, to see what was going on in, in Beijing. But I can see the genuine uh, concern of the students for a better China. What they were asking for would be normal anywhere in the world. They are just kids. Kids who have a heart for the country, but who know very little about politics. Who know very little about the, the art of, of, of uh, uh, staging a, a fight with the government. Towards the end of May, there was a strong sense among the students that we're probably not going to have much chance of winning. But there has to be something, some symbol for us to watch, for us to remember, for us to rally around. 
So a group of artists made a statue which we called Goddess of Democracy. And when it first brought into Tiananmen Square, at that moment, it almost as if martial law does not exist. It's almost that we were celebrating the formation and the beginning of a new republic. We successfully resist martial law and the tank troops for 13 days until the army received the order that they have to occupy the square and at whatever cost. They can feel the air become more and more heavy and the danger is coming step by step. But we don't know exactly how and when and where. The majority um, decision from student body was that people decide to stay, but whoever want to leave, they can. So there was over 20,000 people in 11 o'clock on square and only 5,000 left. The last final hour is coming, and we see 100 yards away, there is a glimmering, you know, machine guns and troops and tanks already facing us. And I look into the students' eyes, and so I told them the story of a thousand ants. One day, a thousand ants who live in the mountain, and the mountain caught on fire. They have to really get to the bottom of the mountain to be able to survive. So the ants rolled together and become a ball, rolled from the top to the bottom. And the outside ants burned to death, and the inside survived. Um, at the last hour, we felt we are the ants outside, and um, like to devote our life for a beloved country and beloved people. I couldn't even allow me to think that they are dying for nothing. I don't know how to say it, I'm a member of the organization, I'm a member of the organization. people have died such a beautiful dream has been killed and all of us still alive
I won't say I killed anybody, but there was a Chinese saying for thousands of years. The person may not be killed by you, but they might be killed because your action, because you. I always feel in such way. There might be many people died right because me, because my action. <laughs> because the mistake I made. survivors out of the square and we moved back to Beijing University and immediately ordered that everybody should now move into hiding as soon as you can. Of当然电视上不会演的开枪，但是我估计到了，因为他们在那反驳，说我们没有开枪，这等于承认人开了枪了。说一个人也没有死，那肯定是死了很多的人。But I came back and again, again, again to those moments that I spent and those decisions. If we left Tiananmen Square before the date of massacre, but I wouldn't feel that it would change the whole situation which evolved later. Every day, there are thousands, tens of thousands of people were arrested. Everything was controlled by the military. So we began to move even more underground. I hid in Beijing for, for like three days, and the situation was enormously dangerous. I was one of those people who were for, first put on the national most wanted list. Our pictures were on the street everywhere. It is almost impossible for a Chinese most wanted to escape from China. I said, no, I'm going to survive. I'm never going to let them get me. If I really wanted to escape, I need to cut off all connection with my family. That's what we did. The best way for me is leave Beijing as quick as possible. It's really hard to do, but uh, with a lot of friends' help, we finally organized to get out from Beijing train station, which is almost the most dangerous place. It was said there would be a three-day nationwide door-by-door uh, -door searching. I hold myself in the cabinet or in the refrigerator for about uh, four or five hours. It has been speculated that organizers of the rescue did use some existing network, namely, I would, I would have thought, smugglers' network. 
if medical supplies can be delivered into Beijing, why can't people be rescued out? It just uh, seems so impossible, so foreign to me, the idea of his escape. I was instructed one day to be at some place, and we were picked up by a minicar. And there was one guy sitting on the front seat, turned back to me and said he was a policeman. I was expecting the next sentence he would say, you were arrested. And he didn't say that. And then he turned back. I, I really don't know what was going on. Actually, they were real police. Their weapons and their uniforms and their handcuffs. I wanted to go back to Nanjing to find my girlfriend, but it was impossible. I have no other alternative just but to follow. I have to give my life to other people uh, that I don't know. On the way to Canton, I was recognized so many times. What is great is that all these people who recognize me tried to help me. No matter how much pressure we had, nobody turn, turned me in. And um, they said they, they, they want to keep me alive because they want to keep their hope alive. I was put in the box underneath the truck. You can't lie down. I just only get to sit like this for hundred or five hours, about five days, and five nights, I guess. We were so lucky. At my reach safety. 那我就在我只能我但是我也不愿意被他们抓住，那我要我要跑一跑，那那就没有跑掉，因为毕竟这个专政机关它的力量还是比较强大的，所以最后还是我在我回到北京的时候被发现了之后就给抓住。I told all these student leaders when they pass through Hong Kong that uh, learn, study. You are a student, you were a student in China, you should be a student, uh, you know, uh, when, once you were in, in France or in, in the States. Uh, you're only 21, 22, you're, you, you're not qualified to be a political activist, uh, a professional political activist anyway. You are not a leader, you are just a, you are just a student who, who, who happened to be there, who was there at the right time at the right place. I don't want to make a long story, but each time on this day, I just can't help remembering all those things happened and all those faces whom I never see again. I really wish that I could have the similar ceremony tonight in Beijing on Tiananmen Square, where those people are sleeping now. I just regarded life as a um, ongoing test. Each person has a potential opportunity to make some kind of differences. And I have decided a long time that there is something, there is one thing that worth of uh, throwing whole of my life, that is to change China. I dreamed that someday I will become one of those who will author the constitution for the new China. So I decided to study economics and law at Columbia University. This is my first past public appearance in the United States.
there are many, many movements, very lonely and uh, difficult, almost desperate, when you finally come to this country, so far away from the homeland, from friends, and also had a struggle in a strange land with new language. I was very depressed. I wrote to my sister at that time. I, I told her that finally able to write after three years from 89. I, 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 I wrote her about what I remember, the family, the, the front garden, and the flowers my mother used to plant. And uh, I remember every summertime when I went back home from Beijing North, it was thousands of miles away. Um, I would read a book outside and in front of the door, and uh, over here there's the steps, closer and closer, that was mom. I told her even. I was just so scared when I thought, yes, I don't belong to this country. And then I don't belong to China either. I only wanted to be a teacher, a good teacher. And then all of a sudden these are all gone, these possibilities are all gone. I have to face the life of being a dissident, a top dissident, uh, which I'm really not. Here, sitting here looking at the Pacific Ocean and the Golden Gate Bridge, I can't let my mind just go. But every time it goes, most, most of times it goes, it goes to China, across, it goes on the, to the end of this water, China. I really started independent life here. I have to recognize myself as a real, ordinary, very, very common person. I shouldn't regard myself as a, such a powerful leader. In a way, I would say I love that, that image of mine. It's such a self-exaggerated image. Thinking yourself as a real leader, you could do something, you could change the history, you could move, mobilize the masses, you could change China. <laughs> I don't really. No, I think in the jail, these few years, 一个很重要的事情就是说，它使我更比八八年、八九年更强烈的感觉到自由是可贵的，使我有更大的决心去要为争取自由做工作。我觉得是这样，就是大家的工作都各有分工，那么他们在国外可以做他们国外的工作，我在国内可以做国内的工作。我觉得这两方面缺一不可，我也时刻关注着他们在国外的一举一动，我也希望他们能够发挥更大的作用。I think a great movement will never die. The spirit probably will reveal itself in different faces, under different masks, but the hope is still there. The spirit is still there. The very absence of democracy in China today precisely means that we have to start to work harder. If one out of five people in the whole world continue to live as a slavery under an extremely oppressive regime, 
Every one of us in the free world share a piece of a blame and also a piece of a responsibility. I have always had the sense that once and again I will be summoned by history. I just worry that time won't be enough for me to prepare myself, to make myself ready when the call comes. 中国当然是迟早要走上这个民主这条道路，但是恐怕也不是不会是很容易的。我我估计这是要有一个比较漫长的、比较困难的、比较坎坷的这么一个过程。当然，这方这在这这个过程中会有很多人做出很大的牺牲，才能争取到。其实，哪一个国家的民主制度都是这样的。都不是很便宜的得来的。This is Jack Anderson's Watch John Washington. I'm honored to welcome Chai Ling. Welcome, Ling. Thank you, Jack. And thank you for. I try basically to keep my mind shut uh, from the tragedy and study very, very hard and work very hard, being very active, just to find a solution. I want to achieve the goal we tried to achieve in '89. I'm in a stage, basically, come up with a solution might be helpful to the current and near future China. I set up the foundation uh, China Dialogue last summer after I graduated from Princeton. The idea of China Dialogue to use the form for conferences, a communication, to educate people who, you know, in the position could make a difference in China. I would very much like to see the day I can complete the work I started. Maybe that's the day I can feel, phew, I can go back now. <laughs> I hope someday I can be free from responsibility and duty I own to the people who lost their life forever on Chai Avenue and Tian Square. I can be free to be the person I want to be. But right now, it just the struggle has to be continued. I haven't forgot. What I, have, what I have done, what I have promised to these uh, who were killed. Um, freedom is just like oxygen. You wouldn't feel it when you have it, but you would definitely feel how important, how valuable it is when you don't have it. 车子停下来之后。I always believe that press freedom will be the very first uh, step for democracy. I host a program called Voice of China, broadcast to China. We are trying, just trying to let people understand a lot of common sense of human rights, of democracy. In, you know, the kind of basic knowledge we wouldn't able to know before. Uh, you know, we wouldn't able to get this kind of uh, information when I was in China, so I know how important it is to have a radio station to tell us a little bit about it. My future is in China. I want to give China freedom. 我原来就估计到会像现在国外的一些人那种结果，离开是长了，慢慢对中国都淡忘了，对中国的事情也不太了解了，就有了隔阂了。那样反而等于自己把自己给毁了。I think I was scared by the event of 1989, so I don't think I can really play an important role in the future. I got to know more and more new friends here, but uh, I never talked to them about June Falls in a personal terms. It's too hard for me, and uh, also I think it's too hard for them to feeling the event as I do. I don't think everybody could have a similar experience. When you were in the center, you might 
exactly was uh, be in charge than people die. It's a... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's hurt me a lot. For me, to live far away from politics is a way to release. Quando When I think of my life so far, through the confusion of memory and emotion, of hope and of fear, the image keeps coming to me of an old Chinese legend I first heard when I was 10. At a time when the darkness of the Cultural Revolution was just beginning to lift. A long, long time ago, there was an old man with his children living in a mountain village. They lived a very happy life with only one big problem. They have to climb over a big mountain to go to the field every day. So one day, the old man decided to move the mountain. With his children, they began chipping away pieces of rocks every day at the foot of the mountain. A wise man passed by and asked him, how can you possibly think you can move the mountain? The old man said, probably I won't. But you see, I have children. My children would have children. And they will continue. And the mountain will be moved. Tiananmen Square is just another attempt to move the mountain. Maybe we failed, but we have not given up, and the mountain will be moved.
Smugglers Network. If medical supplies can be delivered into Beijing, why can't people be rescued out? It's just uh, seems so impossible, so foreign to me, the idea of escape. I was instructed one day to be at some place, and we were picked up by a minicar. And there was one guy sitting on the front seat, turned back to me and said, it was a policeman. I was expecting the next sentence he would say, you were arrested. And he didn't say that. And then he turned back. I, I really don't know what was going on. Actually, they were real police. Their weapons and their uniforms and their handcuffs. I wanted to go back to Nanjing to find my girlfriend, but it was impossible. I have no other alternative, just but to follow. I have to give my life to other people uh, that I don't know. On the way to Canton, I was recognized so many times. What is great is that all these people who recognize me tried to help me. No matter how much pressure we had, nobody tur turned me in. And um, they said they, they, they want to keep me alive because they want to keep their hope alive. I was put in the box underneath the truck. You can't lie down. I just only get to sit like this for hundred or five hours, about five days, or five nights, I guess. We were so lucky. They didn't find us. The organizers of the rescue operation have gotten out more than 130 people. The escape operation would have cost something close to 10 million Hong Kong dollars. Once they got into Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Alliance in, in support of democracy in China would uh, look after them until they are uh, received by a foreign country. From the ocean, you begin to see some lights of the high towers of Hong Kong. And that was the first time in my life I ever seen such kind of thing. It was, a, it represented a kind of different world, a different civilization, completely foreign to me. I don't know whether it's dangerous uh, or not. I don't know what lies ahead of me. Some of them come to Hong Kong, they still know very nervous. Uh, they feel very bad. Because they already escaped a long time in, in mainland. When they are over then they still very nervous. And sometimes they wake up in the midnight and just cry and cry. For the first time, ever since the massacre, I feel at my reach safety. <laughs> I told all these student leaders when they pass through Hong Kong that uh, learn, study, you are a student, you were a student in China, you should be a student, uh, you know, uh, when, once you were in, in France or in, in the States. Uh, you're only 21, 22, you're, you, you're not qualified to be a political activist, uh, a professional political activist anyway. You are not a leader. You are just a, you are just a student who, who who happened to be there, who was there at the right time at the right place. 
I don't want to make a long story, but each time on this day, I just can't help remembering all those things happened and all those faces whom I never see again. I really wish that I could have the similar ceremony tonight in Beijing on Tiananmen Square, where those people are sleeping now. I just regarded life as a um, ongoing test. Each person has a potential opportunity to make some kind of differences. And I have decided a long time that there is something, there is one thing that worth of uh, 